We are very happy to be here on behalf of EDP and share with you this Alumni Unite 2017. I hope you're enjoying it so far, and I hope you continue enjoying it long, long into the night. So, as Falco said, we are going to talk to you about the rookie's mindset. But before we start, we actually wanted to tell you why we chose this topic and not any other. I'm going to be honest with you. When they told us that we would be delivering this keynote speech, we were very worried because we had absolutely no idea what to talk to you about. Uh, we threw some ideas around. We thought maybe about the energy sector, talk about the trends in the future and what is going to happen in the, in the world. But then we thought, I mean, we just started working a year ago. So it means that a year ago, we would be the ones on the other room actually getting our diplomas. So honestly, who cares what we think about the energy sector? And then we thought, OK, maybe not that. So maybe talk about the career. So how is it on the job market, how it is to get a job? And again, we thought, fine, that can be interesting. But we just started working for a year. Who cares about our career advice and what we have to say? Well, probably no one. So we kept coming back to this idea that we are just rookies. We're just starting. So we just have a beginner's perspective. And then we thought, why not just speak about that? Why not just say, what makes rookies special? And what can they bring to the table? And it was very interesting, because first, everyone has been a rookie once in their life. They have all started something, a new job, a new career, a new hobby, learning a new skill. They all felt what it is to be a beginner. And we also thought, and found afterwards before research, that it's a very misunderstood phase because some companies and people think that rookies can only deliver value after they stop, become, after they stop being rookies. So as a rookie, you're just there until you learn to do stuff, and then can you add value. And that's not true at all. So our point of, of our presentation is very simple, is to show you that as a rookie, you have a way of looking at things that more experienced people do not, and you can add value even if you're not as experienced or not as knowledgeable as other people. So let's start. First of all, with a definition. What is experience? Now, I'm pretty sure all of you know what experience is. And I think this is a pretty much standard definition. So the knowledge that you gain by experiencing one thing ever, over and over, that you have observed and caught or under the, and they're gone. And this is pretty straight, straightforward. I mean, the more you experience, the more you know. The more you know, the better you are at doing things. But this is only valid if knowledge is static. What happens if the world keeps changing? What happens if you start, I don't know, five years learning how to build a typewriter and typewriters stop being sold? What happens to your knowledge? It becomes obsolete. And what is very curious is that this obsolescence of knowledge can be measured, and it has been measured. According to recent researches by Grubler and Matt Nemeth, it seems that knowledge has an expiration date. True. It expires at 15% per year. So it means that what you know now in a year only 85% will hold true. Then a bit over 70, then 55, then even less. In four years, five, you've come from 100% to less than 50. Your knowledge is no longer valid. Boom, 30 now. And the thing is, what is much worrisome is that you don't even know which part of the 30 is correct still. How can you say? Which part do you know and which part do you not know? So it means that knowledge expired. So how can you battle this march of ignorance? How can you do it? It's very simple, actually. You just have to continue learning and validating your knowledge. You have to go back and check your assumptions. Are you sure that it still holds? Are you sure that it's still true? Is your experience valid? And the problem is that when you get more experience, you'll see that it's very difficult to check your assumptions. You start seeing things in a way that is very difficult to check if you're actually correct. And you'll see that. I hope that you'll fight it when the time comes, but you'll see that it will happen to you as well. Now, experience can also lock you up on a paradigm. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to read this slide, because I think you'll find it very interesting. It's a quote by Albert Mitchelson, a physicist in the end of the 20th century. So what is important here? As you can see, he says that most of the facts of physical science have been discovered. Everything is known. The only thing we can do now is improve our knowledge by precision in measurement. Now, why is this very curious? First, because he said it in 1894, which is roughly 10 years before Einstein completely revolutionized the world of physics. So it was completely miss. I don't know if there is anyone here who wants to be a researcher. Is there anyone here who wants to be a researcher in the future? No? No one wants to go into R&D? No one? 
Because the thing is, if you're going to R&D, sooner or later you're going to feel this impulse to actually say something like this. I hope you avoid it, because it will make you look bad in like 50 years, 100 years. Because people will be pointing at quotes of you and saying, guys, you were completely wrong. I'm sorry. Because the thing is, not only was Michelson wrong in 1994, because 10 years later Einstein completely revolutionized the world of physics, he was even more wrong, if that is possible, because one of the main proofs that the current system was wrong, and that Einstein was correct, was discovered in an experiment done in 1987 by none other than Michelson. So Michelson does an experiment that proves conclusively that the current paradigm was wrong. He has seven years to think about it and see the implication. He still has the nerve to say this just to Einstein a couple of years later, proving him wrong. Uh, you can already see that he knows what he did, eh? he did. He knows what he did. So what happened to Michelson? Was it lack of intelligence? I'm pretty sure it wasn't, because he was actually the first American to actually win a Nobel Prize. So what happened? He was a man on top of his game, with a lot of resources, a lot of time to think, and then he said this. He said this because when you get experience, you start using a tool. You start using the same tool all over again, and it's successful. It makes sense. If you're winning, why change it? The problem is that when you start doing this, you start gaining a lot of focus but you lose range, you lose ability to think in different manners. And then, when the day comes and your tool no longer works, what happens? You have no experience in building another one, so you're lost. Don't be like Michelson. Learn that you can always see things in a different manner. Learn to take a step back. Learn to be a rookie. So, what is a rookie? This is the standard definition. You're a beginner, a starter, or someone who is new to something. Not very clear, I think, but you'll see, you'll see in a minute. As you can see, there is no age here. You don't have to be a teenager, you don't have to be a graduate, you don't have to be 50 year old, 60, 100, you can be whatever age you want to be a rookie. You just have to know that you're starting something new. So, are you starting a new job? Congratulations, you're a rookie. Are you starting a new career after 15 years in engineering? Congratulations, you're a rookie. Are you delivering your first presentation in front of 200 people? Congratulations, you're a rookie. So the thing is, rookies are everywhere when people are starting something new and they know it. So what do rookies do? Now, I'm going to share with you a Portuguese word that is one of our proudest contributions to the world, together with Pastel Nata and Cristiano Ronaldo, and maybe our discoveries in, in India. So it's the word desenrascar. That means the act of improvising a sound solution or plan without really knowing what you're doing. And that's what you do when you, get, uh, when you are assigned a task that you have no idea what to do, no idea at all, but you have to make it happen. So what do you do? You start doing it. I'm going to tell you as well that it usually involves a lot of praying and cursing. Because that's the truth. I mean, you're going to curse a lot, you're going to pray a lot, but in the end you'll do whatever it takes to do it. And I want to tell you two things in this slide. First, as you can already see, this rookie mindset and this activity to Zenrashkar is not really applicable to all activities. I don't want a brain surgeon operating on me with this mindset, please. <laughs> I don't want my accountant to actually look at my account and say, okay, I'm going to do something uh, rookie mindset and I'm just going to do whatever I, I feel like. So it's not really applicable everywhere, but it's key if you want to do something new, if you want to innovate, because you can see that by doing this way, by starting from scratch without really knowing what you're doing, you can see things that most people cannot. And I also have another thing that I would like to tell you. If you're ever in doubt, that you, in a, you are in the rookie mindset, or if you are actually in this trying to design I, I will give you a hint, so you can use it in the future. Do you know the expression, think outside the box? I think pretty much everyone has heard it. So when you're in this mode, you don't have to worry about it, because there is no box. You pray to God that someone gives you a box to sit inside, because there is no way you're going to find it. If you, are in, you are completely in the wild. So if you want a box to sit inside and feel safe, you have to build it yourself because you are doing something completely new. You are in open field. So you have to move and do and expect the best. So, I know you like numbers. So, yeah, let's start from the beginning. Four, it seems that rookies are four times more likely to ask for help when they are doing a task. And by doing that, they talk to five times more experts. This means that if you have a rookie versus an expert, I think we can give a bit an edge to the expert, so the expert wins. But the fact that the rookie is not alone, he talks to five experts, so it's no longer one rookie versus one expert. It's one rookie plus five experts versus one expert, and you know who's going to win. Rookies are not afraid of asking questions, because you don't know. You have no ego to protect, because you are trying to make something happen. <laughs> you just want it to work out in the end. If you seem like you don't know what you're doing, or if you don't know what 
in hell you're trying to do. Who cares? You're just trying to make it happen. 12, we are, it seems that rookies are 12% more likely to resist in case of failure. Why? Because rookies fail all the time. You don't know how to find the copy machine. You don't know how to print it. You don't know how to... F if you stopped when you, when you failed, you wouldn't do anything. We just don't care anymore. We just want to get something done. And we do it. And that's the key. 60. It seems that rookies are 60% more likely to deliver a product, a solution, in a timely manner. Because we have to make it work. This is our first project, our second project. We, we are new to the team. We are trying to do something new. We have to make it work. We are 100% focused. And we do whatever it takes. And last but not least, two. Rookies are twice more likely to feel they have something to learn. And you've seen before that learning is key because if you stop learning, sooner or later you're going to stop knowing. And if you stop knowing, I'm pretty sure sooner or later you're going to be stop being relevant. So learning is key. It's important and just go for it. I mean, rookies, what makes them great is exactly that. They ask questions. They don't mind if they look stupid or not. At least they try not to mind. And they just go for it. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, no, no, that's great, amazing, that looks super cool, but I cannot do this alone. I work in a company. Are there companies that actually value this? Are there companies where they have this culture of fostering this rookie mindset? Well? Well, no, no, this is a very good question. And what I can tell you is that companies don't only recognize the added value of this rookie mindset, but they, all, they also adapt their own strategy to complement their teams with graduates, which are the perfect example for this rookie status. And what, for example, one of the companies that is doing this now, it's EDP, and what they're trying to do is create the best conditions to keep this rookie mindset alive, while obviously taking the most out of it, the most of our contributions to the projects we are allocated in. So what they do, they create three to six month rotations where you are in different departments within the EDP group, trying to uh, learn as much as possible of different areas of expertise and skills. They give us training plans, they give us short assignments, three weeks to solve really difficult questions in very short period of time. And of course, it's a daily challenge at work. And the proof is then, in less than 10 years of, uh, 10 months of experience, 17 rookies are being rotating for seven different locations within the EDP group. And we are being assigned to different projects which require her, from us different skills. And this is not only valuable for us, we are able to learn a lot, obviously work a lot as well, but grow within the EDP group, but also for the company itself by incorporating new ways of thinking and new approaches to work. And how do they do this? To including young people who seek always to learn and question all the information they receive even if it's offshore wind, if it's human resources, risks and markets, customer experience, energy management, I don't know, many areas. And when I say that we question all the information, I really mean, because if we're not confident with what they're saying, we will question until the end. And I will tell you my story within the EDP graduate program. So back to January 2017, I was moved to Scotland, Edinburgh, which for me coming from Lisbon was already sort of a challenge because there the sun appears once in a while, <laughs> not every day. And on my very first day at work, my boss calls me. We sit down, I had no computer, no notebook, no pen, and he asks me, well, Alex, have you heard about weather modeling? Do you know those two seconds when you're panicking inside but you're still smiling and trying to say something really <laughs> that makes sense and look, makes you look clever to your new boss. Well, I was in that position. And the only thing I could think about was this famous picture of Prince Charles presenting me the weather forecast of Scotland. And I had to be honest, I had to say, I mean, sorry, but I have no idea about weather modeling. Until two seconds ago, I didn't know about offshore wind. I mean, I studied energy technologies, but don't expect me to be the expert in offshore wind. And he looks at me a bit concerned. Well, you know, weather modeling is really important because we go out there in the middle of nowhere with our vessels, with our people, with a tight schedule, and we need to know how is the weather behaving. We need to understand if it's safe to go, how much are we going to spend, how long are we going to take to then produce energy and deliver it to the UK. And I thought, well, bye, thank you very much. <laughs> Until the next project. <laughs> 
And I had so many questions. Which model are we, going, are we talking about? Am I going to develop my own model? Am I going to use someone's model? Is it a software that you bought so we have technicians to help us using the model? Am I going to be alone? Are you going to supervise it from a long distance? Are you going to support me on a daily basis? I mean, what's the deadline? Am I, am I going to deliver something next week, in the next three months, six months, one year? I don't know. And I was totally lost. And those of you who know me here know that the first thing I did was panic. I mean, I didn't know what to do. And even worse, I panic a lot. So I panic for like two months out of my six months rotations. But I knew that this wouldn't take me anywhere. So if I would have to do weather modeling, I would have to check the model. And I did it. So I checked the model they were using for at least five years in that project. How do we actually understand these? How do we actually schedule our construction? And I discovered that this model was developed in C++, which once again, I don't know anything about. So it was a good start. This is my best friend for the past six months, C++ for dummies. Because I mean, how can I work with something C++ model that I don't have any idea. So I read about C++ programming. I asked my friends. I see you, Azif. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, I read about offshore wind construction. I read about vessels, technicians. I saw what Siemens, Dong, Iberdrola were doing. I mean, I just tried. But the, my only question was, how does this weather model work? So I went to talk to the developer. And I asked her lots of questions because, by the way, she was working at EDP. I was like, I mean, why did you develop the model in this way? How do you actually make sure that the model is accurate as much as you can? Because in the end, you're going to build one gigawatt wind farm in the middle of North Sea without actually knowing if this is good or not. And then she explained me everything. And I was even more lost in this C++ programming. And then I understood that, OK, I don't know anything about C++ programming. Probably I wouldn't be able to learn it in these six months to make an actually real contribution. So what I did was, I have my input data. I know that I cannot change this weather model, but I can see if this model is as valuable as the others that other companies are using, the others that software companies are developing and selling to our competitors. So what I did was using and trying to get trials for at least 10 different software companies. I had tons of meetings with sales directors. I asked really stupid rookie questions about Java programming, whatever. <laughs> and I tried to understand how can we make sure that EDP is planning the construction in the best way possible. And after six months in Scotland, I understood that actually the model we were using for the past, time, past period was too, way too conservative. So instead of having a construction of, let's assume, 400 days, we were saying that it would take us 500 days. And the boat we saw in the beginning, before this slide, costs 150,000 Euro, euros per day. So if you just make a simple calculation, it's 150,000 euros multiplied by 100 days. We're already talking millions. And this is just the vessel. What about the technicians? What about the environmental requirements? What about health and safety certificates? And then one million and a half goes to five millions. And I went from looking at Prince Charles telling me that it's going to rain in Scotland, I mean, thanks you a lot, <laughs> to save five millions in one project. But of course, I didn't do this alone. So I was surrounded by experts in the industry that work at EDP. I got lots of support from these directors and technicians on other software companies which actually I didn't buy any software, but they were still they were willing to help. They were willing to share their knowledge. And that's one of the importance of, the, of being able to be a rookie, but also taking the, mo the most out of experts that also work with you. And Nunu knows as well, because we were together at EDP in October 2017, uh, 16 when we started. We got our first assignment together for EDP renewables. And they asked us this question. Are we able to combine wind and solar in a profitable way for the company? I was like, okay, and how long do we have to see to analyze this sensitivity analysis, Excel? We have to make market research. Just two weeks. Okay, just two weeks. Thank you. <laughs> so we didn't panic because we were like five working on this, so it's okay, we'll manage. But we were so stuck in this idea that we would have to be a rookie. We would have to change the world in these two weeks that they would expect us to think out of the box, with or without box, to <laughs> change the world, that we didn't even think 
on the idea that I know you are thinking because you are engineers. And we went to see this startup in the United States that developed this huge turbine with solar panels on the blade. <laughs> Sorry, because it was ridiculous. And we had the guts to go to the supervisor and actually present this as a solution for EDP. <laughs> And he listened to us until the end, and then he said, oh, well, thank you a lot for your contribution. I mean, it's, it's really nice to know that on the other side of the ocean, somebody is trying to put solar panels on the blades. But what I need is actually something that takes advantage of the tons of wind farms that we have already constructed, something that will work in the next three, four months. And it was the moment when we understood that actually what he was mentioned was hybrid systems. I mean, we didn't even stop one second to think about hybrid systems. And this is the message I want to give you tonight, is that, yes, it's good to be a rookie. Yes, we are seen as this blank canvas, always open for innovation, always willing to take challenges to the next level. But we wouldn't uh, reach our full potential without being surrounded by experts that know how the world and the industry actually works. And they will always make sure that we avoid making the same mistakes they did 10, 15, 20 years ago. And we have a sentence to share with you that we want you to think about it when you are stuck in a presentation, in a meeting, in starting your new job, is that sometimes the less you know, the more you can see. Thank you.